Section 21 of the Early Tudors by Charles Edward Moberly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 15. The Yorkist Conspiracy, Anne of Cleves, Six Articles, The Fall of Cromwell, 1538 to 1539, Part 1. It seemed fated that revolts against Henry should fail for want of combination. This, as we have seen, had been the case with the conspiracy of the nobles and the two acts of the pilgrimage of grace. And now the fourth division of the same general movement was to be managed still more impotently and to bring still wider ruin on its promoters. The House of York in 1538, chiefly represented by the Marquis of Exeter, whose mother, Lady Courtney was Edward the Fourth's daughter, and by Lady Salisbury, who was the daughter of George, Duke of Clarence, niece to King Edward and sister to the Earl of Warwick, who had perished with Warbeck. The sons of this venerable lady were Lord Montague and Arthur, Reginald, and Geoffrey Pole. The Marquis of Exeter had unwillingly joined in the suppression of the Pilgrimage of Grace yet remained bitterly hostile to Cromwell and the new teaching. Since then he had been complained of as hindering the course of justice in his own county, and now information came from members of his household that he was raising men in Cornwall with the view of getting himself named heir to the crown, and from a painter at the turbulent Cornish village of St. Kevern that orders had been given for a banner of the five wounds. On farther inquiry, it appeared that the tenacious Cornishman had not forgotten Blackheath Field and still longed to overthrow the Tudor dynasty. That the Poles shared in the plot was presently made too clear by the cowardice of Sir Geoffrey, who, to shield himself, volunteered evidence that his brother Lord Montague and Lord and Lady Exeter were all in correspondence with Cardinal Reginald Pole. The danger was serious, for other evidence showed that Paul III was plotting a Spanish conquest of Ireland and had sent Pole to Liège that he might be near enough to hold all the threads of the intrigue together. And worst of all, the Emperor had for some unexplained purpose collected 200 ships at Antwerp. The strongest measures were therefore adopted. Exeter and Montague were put on their trial and condemned, not for the conspiracy, which it was better to keep as secret as possible, but as traitors in word. Lady Exeter and Lady Salisbury were attainted and imprisoned in the tower. On this occasion, Henry asked the judges whether Parliament could attaint without giving any reason. Their reply was that the question was dangerous, that Parliament is bound to set an example not of lawlessness but of justice, yet that if it did so deal with any one, his attainder would hold. It might have been expected that being thus attacked by the Pope would have made Henry more Protestant. Yet it had not this effect, as he seemed still anxious to prove himself as faithful as any rebel could be to the old religion, undeterred by a danger which after all had not been extreme. He also really hated, as we have seen, the spirit of ribaldry which had set in under the pretense of religion. To meet this he first published an earnest and even touching exhortation to decent reverence in externals, and then, after proclaiming an amnesty for past offences against religion, set himself to consider how they might be prevented in the future. Even on the principles of our own time, some punishment was required to check disorder, for Bible reading aloud in church had been made an excuse for interrupting the service and abusing its minister, and if a zealous Protestant disliked any church ceremony, he was not unlikely to rate the clergyman performing it and tell him loudly that he did not. Some were reported as common singers against the sacraments and ceremonies, others as players of interludes railing on the priesthood, others again as mimicking the elevation of the host with the most odious profanity. To deal with this state of things, a commission was formed of Cromwell, the two archbishops, and six bishops representing various parties. But as these could not agree on their report, 
or at any rate did not send it in at once, the Duke of Norfolk moved in the House of Lords that Parliament as a whole should discuss the main points of controversy and settle the law concerning them. The result was an act imposing by lay authority alone the celebrated six articles, the very sound of which was thought certain to daunt the profane. In the first of these, transubstantiation, the very antithesis of Protestantism, was again and finally affirmed. Anyone denying it was to be burned without any chance of saving himself by retractation. In the next four, communion in one kind was asserted to be sufficient, the observance of vows of chastity was enjoined, and private masses and auricular confession maintained. Whoever twice denied any of these was to suffer death as a felon. All marriages contracted by priests were pronounced void, and the wives were to be dismissed by a certain day. To refuse communion or confession was also felony. Of course, if this act had been fully enforced, there would have been a persecution worthy of Alva or Torquemada, and for a few days the risk of this appeared considerable. As in the city of London, where the Roman party formed a committee at Mercer's Hall, and denounced not less than five hundred of their fellow citizens as heretics. But the king was not inclined to persecute on this scale. He allowed the accused to be securities for one another, and so dismissed them. Partly from his backwardness, and partly from Cromwell's opposition, the six articles, though professedly in force for eight years, were really so only at intervals, and when Henry gave permission as there were four of these short persecutions in the remainder of the reign, some of them specially cruel, and costing on the whole twenty-seven lives, the result of the act is sufficiently lamentable not to need exaggerations. Historians, therefore, should not have spoken of Gardiner and the bishops as daily sending men to the stake under it. One of its first consequences was that Cranmer sent his wife abroad, and Latimer and Shaxton were deprived of their sees. At about the same time an act of Parliament vested the abbey lands in the king, and those to whom he granted them, thus establishing, as Mr. Hallam remarks, the wealth of great families like the Russells, who were to be famous in after years, and at last to become the surest barrier against tyranny in England. So was completed the dissolution of the monasteries, which every historian must be glad at last to dismiss. Unhappily, some of its last scenes were also the ugliest, as when the abbot of Glastonbury, who had hidden his plate in the hope of better times, was hanged for his crime at the top of the tor close by, to be seen far and wide across the Somersetshire plain. In strong contrast with such horrors stands the admission of Wales into the English polity, which is the most honourable thing Henry ever did. Indeed, its effect on Welsh turbulence has been compared by Burke to the calming of the tempest when the twins are first seen above the horizon. According to existing laws, no Welshman could buy land or house in or near any city or town in the marches, or be a burgess of any corporate English town, or an apprentice in any English town whatever. The manufacture and import of armour was forbidden in Wales, and all Welsh meetings were unlawful except by special licence. The vernacular poet Glyn Cothy complains bitterly that his furniture had been confiscated on his presuming to marry an Englishwoman. Had he been English and his wife Welsh, he would have forfeited all franchises and made himself a Welshman in the eye of the law. Unlike his father, Henry the Eighth thought much of the principality in the latter years of his reign, and it was settled by various statutes that the English law alone should be current there, that instead of the despotic jurisdiction of the Lord's marchers, justices of the peace should be established and hold sessions in each county twice a year, that Welsh-born subjects should have the same privileges as Englishmen, and that each county and each county town should send a member to Parliament. As raids into England might still happen, it was ordered that no ferry boat should take any Welshman across the Severn by night, and by way of compliment to this, 
English disorder was repressed by the vigour of Roland Lee, the warden of the marches, both in Cheshire, which had long presumed on its privileges as a county palatine not subject to the royal courts, by sending bands out to plunder neighbouring counties, and in Shropshire and Herefordshire, which used their positions on the border for the same purpose. When Henry's hand was refused by the Duchess of Milan, Cromwell, finding the six articles passed in spite of him, devised a singularly bold plan for saving Protestantism in England by marrying Henry to some lady who would lead him in that direction. Anne, sister to the Duke of Cleves, seemed well suited for this purpose, for the Duke was a Protestant, and his dominions, which included Juliesberg and part of Hanover, placed him in the closest connection with the Protestant states of Hesse and Saxony, and with Hermann, Archbishop of Cologne, who was already showing the Protestant tendencies, which led to his deposition in 1543. He was therefore a most important member of the Schmalkaldic League against the Emperor, which had been formed in 1531, and had, on the 10th of July, 1536, been enlarged and renewed for ten years, the contingent of troops which each of its members was to supply being also arranged against emergencies. Moreover, he had claims on Gelderland, which, if established, would make his territory like an open gate for anyone wishing to attack the emperor, either in Holland or Germany, and having France for an ally. Cromwell, therefore, threw his whole force into the negotiation, hoping thus to checkmate the party which had carried the six articles and which wished to see Charles invade England. On the 27th of December, 1539, the lady landed at Deal. On the 31st, Henry met her at Rochester and found her lamentably unlike Holbein's portrait, quite devoid of accomplishments, knowing no language but her own, and much marked with the smallpox. His consternation was extreme. He could hardly utter a word, and forgot to take from his pocket the present which he had prepared. Foreigners in those days were sometimes half surprised and more than half amused at our caring so much for female beauty, and Henry was as English in this point as his father had been. Hardly would he have submitted to such an infliction even for a cherished purpose of his own, much less for one with which he only half sympathized. Could not a pre-contract be made out? No, the lady was very decidedly free and after all it would not do to throw the duke into the alliance between Charles and Francis, which was now assuming the most threatening appearance, Charles being actually on a visit to the French court, and ominously refusing all inquiry into the treatment of Englishmen in Spain by the Inquisition. So the marriage took place on the 6th of January, 1540, hateful though it was to the bridegroom, and unpopular because of the risk from it to Flemish trade. For the next five months a life-and-death struggle went on between the two religious parties. Cromwell seemed for a while to be scoring at all points. He was created Earl of Essex on the 17th of April, and afterwards a Knight of the Garter, and succeeded in imprisoning some of his antagonists or driving them from the council. It was expected every day that Gardiner would be sent to the tower. The minister also carried the attainder of some priests, one of Queen Catherine's household, who had been contumacious ever since, and succeeded in checking the action of the Six Articles and in abolishing many rites of sanctuary. But all the time his main scheme was collapsing miserably. He could not persuade Francis to join the League of Protestant Germany, and its members in alarm made their peace with Charles for the time. This was the opportunity for which Cromwell's enemies had been waiting. Now their charges, carefully gathered for years, might securely be hurled at him. On the 10th of June, Henry allowed him to be arrested at the council table, the other members loudly proclaiming him a traitor and tearing the ribbon of the garter from his neck. He was immediately attainted on eight charges, the substance of which was that he had planned to crush the nobles of England and to form a confederacy of heretics in the country 
by means of which he might raise a rebellion. He was truly or falsely sworn to have said that if the king and realm varied from his opinions, he would fight against them sword in hand, and that if he lived a year or two, he would bring matters to such a state that the king would have no power to change it even if he desired. Events then rushed on with lightning speed. The attainder was passed by acclamation about the 19th of June. On the 1st of July, Norfolk and the new government carried a bill for the better observance of the six articles. On the 7th, the king's late marriage was brought before convocation and annulled on the wonderful plea that it had been extorted under compulsion by external causes. On the 12th, an act of Parliament was carried to the same effect, and Anne of Cleves, intending to remain in England, was endowed with three thousand pounds a year in the grotesque title of the king's sister. On the 28th, Cromwell laid his head on the block, and two days later, Barnes, Garrett, and Jerome, who had rashly put themselves forward as opponents of Gardiner, were sent at the stake as gainsayers of the six articles the priests attainted by Cromwell being hanged at the same place and time for denying the supremacy. Soon after this, Parliament, which had in the previous year given to Henry's proclamation the force of laws, thus going near to establish a kind of Turkish despotism in the state, did nearly the same in church matters by enabling a committee of the archbishops, bishops, and certain doctors of divinity acting with the king's sanction, that is, the king himself, to declare absolutely the judgment of the English church on all questions of theology, whether raised here or on the continent, and to enforce it by pains and penalties. End of section 21. Section 22 of The Early Tudors by Charles Edward Moberly this LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 15, The Yorkist Conspiracy, Anne of Cleves, Six Articles, The Fall of Cromwell, 1538-1539, Part 2. In April of this year, James V of Scotland, on his way back from France, stopped for a short time off Scarborough, and boldly received a deputation of Yorkshire gentlemen asking for the help against Henry, which he was well disposed to grant. After 1524, he had soon begun drifting back toward the French alliance. True, the negotiations for his marriage with Mary were more than once renewed, but neither side would take the first step, the Scottish statesman declaring that a lasting peace would be easy after the marriage, and Henry wishing for a reliable treaty before it. Till Margaret's divorce from Angus was granted in 1528, and she was allowed to marry a new favorite, Lord Methuen, she had been quite resolved to seek for help wherever she could find it, and as none came from Henry, this meant that she would appeal to France. Therefore, two political parties became clearly defined, that of the Lords Angus, Lennox, Murray, Glencairn, and Sir George Douglas, who were prepared to go all lengths for the English connection, being opposed to Methuen, Aaron, and James and David Betton, successive archbishops of St. Andrews, who were in the French interest. From 1528 forward, the beginnings of the Reformation in England made the Scots anti-reformers, inclined to ally themselves with our enemies still more closely and to mark their religious zeal by persecution. Thus Patrick Hamilton, the proto-martyr of the Scottish Reformation, was burned in that year for denying pilgrimage, purgatory, prayer to the saints, and such trifles, says Knox. And for some time there was an exodus from Scotland of gentlemen and clerks escaping with their lives from charges of reading the Bible in English, and asking Lord Dacre for relief when they were across the border. James, as time went on, was heard to boast that he was to be made Duke of York not by his uncle, but by the Emperor. And when Henry went to York to have an interview with him, the rash young man was induced by the bribes of the church party to break his engagement 
thus giving up the chance of seeing how widely different from his own kingdom was that which might fall to him as Henry's son-in-law, and which his grandson was at length to inherit. As the Catholic partisans were quite determined to stop the English negotiations altogether, they also induced James to marry Magdalen, the beautiful but delicate daughter of Francis I, who died within a few months from the change of climate. It was in bringing home this bride that he received the Scarborough deputation and heard how they were robbed and murdered and how much they longed for him to come and have all. On arriving at Leith, he bade farther defiance to England by prosecuting some of Angus's relations and supporters, his sister, Lady Glamis, a woman of great beauty and intelligence, was burned alive for treason, as Lady Bulmer had been in England. After Magdalen's death, Henry renewed his advances, but found James fatally resolved on a second French wife, Mary of Guise, the widow of the Duc de Longueville, whom he married in June 1538. Henry, meanwhile, was preparing two deadly blows against his recreant nephew, the first of these was an attempt to get him kidnapped while hunting on the border. A paper still remains in which the English council remarked that they find in the scheme many difficulties, above all the risk of a struggle in which James might be killed and the infamy thence arising. They admit that the proposer, Sir Robert Wharton, an English commander on the border, may have had a good meaning in proposing it, but think that he ought to be strictly charged to carry it no farther and not to communicate it to any living creature. The second scheme bore a still more threatening aspect, for Henry ordered that search should be made by Lee, the Archbishop of York, for all ancient records of homage paid by Scotland to England, manifestly intending to take up his old quarrel where Edward II had been compelled to leave it. He also allowed his Parliament in an address to him to call James an usurper of the kingdom which rightly belonged to his majesty. Thus the two parties were bent on a war which might have wrecked the fortunes of both countries. Fortunately, neither possessed organizing power sufficient for a great enterprise, and though each side was well inclined to push on with reckless haste, material of war was almost entirely wanting. The Duke of Norfolk was ordered to advance with 30,000 men by Berwick to the Lothians, but provisions soon failed him, and he was obliged to disband his troops for fear of starvation. On this, James vindictively insisted on crossing the Esk and ravaging Cumberland, but the nobles told him that they had done their feudal duty in defending Scotland and had no idea of going any farther. Maddened by their refusal, he declared that they were all traitors, and not obscurely hinted that he should sweep off a hundred of them by proscription. Meanwhile, he called for volunteers who were to meet at Lochmaben and receive their orders there, and about ten thousand men obeyed the summons. It was only when they were already in England that they found they were to be commanded not by the king in person, but by Oliver Sinclair, a most unpopular court favorite. This produced a commotion in the army in the midst of which they were suddenly charged by a few hundreds of English border horsemen. Imagining that Norfolk was upon them, they actually turned and fled homewards. But missing the way, most of them reached the Solway when the tide was up and were either drowned in attempting to cross it or taken prisoners on the English side. The king had remained at Kerlaverick Castle during the expedition. He now returned in the deepest dejection to Falkland, with bad news dogging him at every step, and his health daily drooping more and more. His two infant sons had both died shortly before, and Mary of Guise was expecting her third confinement at Edinburgh. On the 7th of December, 1542, the news came of the birth of another Mary, so soon to be known by the fated name of Queen of Scots. It came with a lass, and it will go with a lass, said the hapless father, in allusion to the throne coming to the Stuarts by a daughter of Bruce, and a week later he died, leaving the government in the hands of the Earl of Erin, the head of the Hamiltons, 
who claimed it because of his father's marriage with James III's sister, which made him next of kin to the infant queen. The new regent at once imprisoned the leaders of the French party, and wrote to Henry a letter of appeal, asking indulgence for the baby kinswoman, who by a calamity which seemed to bring back the days of Flodden, was now the hope of her country. Henry replied by offering to marry his son to the infant, and strongly endeavoring to win over the prisoners of Solway Moss to his plan, which was that Mary should at once be sent to England for education, that Edinburgh, Stirling, and Dumbarton should receive English garrisons, and that Cardinal Betton, the great enemy of England, should be transferred to an English prison. The Scots, on their part, were willing to accept of the marriage, but only on the absurd condition that if ever the two crowns were on one head, an independent regency of Scotland should for the time belong of right to the Arran family. Henry's other conditions would, they declared, be resisted by every man, woman, and child in Scotland. After much uncertainty, a treaty was at last signed at Greenwich, July 1, 1543, providing for an alliance between the countries during the life of the two sovereigns and one year more. The queen was now to be allowed to stay with her mother till the age of ten. In case the crowns were united, the liberties of Scotland were fully guaranteed. If the infant Mary ever became a childless widow, she was to resume possession of her kingdom in peace. The settlement seemed hopeful, yet the bond was torn up almost before it was drawn by the audacity of Cardinal Button, who carried off Mary from Linlithgow to Stirling Castle, where she was in the power of his partisans, and on this even Edwin himself, unable any longer to stem the torrent of popular longing for independence, joined the Romish party, cancelled the Greenwich Treaty, withdrew a recently granted permission to read the Bible, and announced that heretics would be prosecuted according to church law. Though the murder of Betton in 1546 at St. Andrews, to which Henry, as Mr. Burton has fully shown, was accessory before the fact, seemed likely to help toward the union with England, yet it had the opposite effect, for in the year after the Cardinal's death, many of the most vigorous spirits of the English party, including John Knox, after holding St. Andrews for a time, were captured by a French army and sent as prisoners to France, leaving no one who could supply their place. It was little comfort that an English force under Lords Lyle and Hartford captured and burned Leith and Edinburgh in the following year, besides wasting Fifeshire, which seldom suffered in such wars. The burning of 243 villages and 192 towns was not the way to produce kinder feelings in Scotland or make the people more content to accept real union. Ireland had also had its own disorders after the death of Lord Thomas Fitzgerald in 1537. Lord Leonard Grey, his captor, was ordered to put down resistance to English authority in the West. To this task he bravely addressed himself, storming various castles on the Shannon, and above all capturing Bren's Bridge over that river near Limerick, which was so strongly fortified with marble works that artillery could make no impression on it, while the ramparts themselves could be approached only across two broken arches which had to be spanned with scaling ladders. But the tide of victory was almost immediately checked by want of money, and it was too clear that the Irish government was farther than ever from the chance of paying its own way. Stung by this disappointment, Lord Leonard was thenceforward at constant variance with his council, whom he treated most harshly and overbearingly, while on service he disgusted his best officers by requiring the impossible and disgracing them if they refused to attempt it. The Dublin Parliament now ventured on throwing out a bill for the dissolution of the Irish monasteries, and enmity to England daily produced the same effects as in Scotland, making the people more and more ardent partisans of Rome. At this juncture Cromwell's fall began to be expected, and Grey, who was intimate with the Duke of Norfolk, 
thought that he might further a reaction in Ireland such as his leader was accomplishing at home. He therefore favored the bishops most opposed to the Reformation, and went so far as to entrust many important charges to the ever-rebellious Fitzgerald family, with whom, as we have seen, he was connected by marriage, and to maintain a bishop made by the Pope, whose appointment he was expressly ordered to disallow. All this, too, was during the perilous times when the fear of the emperors invading Ireland was not yet at an end. He then made a progress through the rebellious districts and reported to Henry that his reception had been most excellent. But even he himself soon discovered that he had been deceived. His new friends were manifestly conspiring to promote the foreign invasion, and in October 1539 he had to attack and defeat the rebellious chiefs on the borders of Ulster. After this he reconciled himself with Ormond and the loyalist nobles whom he had offended, and asked for a few weeks' leave of absence from his government. This was allowed, but his locum tenens, Sir W. Brereton, soon informed Henry of new insurrections, the direct effects of Grey's wrong-headedness. The king sent the deputy to the tower and ordered the chief members of the Irish council to come over and give their evidence against him. It was sworn that Grey had abused those who spoke ill of Cardinal Pole, that he had taken bribes from Irish chiefs, had connived at their attacks on the more loyal, and had released from prison untried men who had been committed for treason. Above all, the incredible charge was hinted, though not expressly made against him, that he had left behind in the West some of the king's guns with the intention that they should be found and used by the invaders. In hope of mercy, Gray pleaded guilty to his actual indictment and was executed on the 28th of June, 1540. St. Ledger, his successor in office, carried out the suppression of the monasteries and by judicious distribution of the spoils managed to procure for the home government a certain respite from Irish troubles. The king, within a few days of his release from Anne of Cleves, married Catherine Howard, another niece of the Duke of Norfolk, a fascinating girl of nineteen, for whose perfections he was strongly inclined to have a special service of thanksgiving drawn up. The poor creature had, however, young as she was, dishonored herself before marriage, and now felt obliged as queen to give appointments about her person by way of hush money to the very men who ought to have kept farthest from her. All her terrible secrets soon came out, and to Cranmer was entrusted the commission of telling Henry how he had been deceived. The only chance of life which remained to Catherine was that she should make the common pre-contract excuse but with a truthfulness which went far to redeem her errors, she refused to make any such statement and was attainted in Parliament for high treason and beheaded on the 12th of February, 1542. With her suffered Lady Rochford, who had before done much to ruin her sister-in-law, Anne Boleyn. On the 27th of May in the preceding year, the noble old Countess of Salisbury, almost the only remaining Plantagenet, was accused for continuing, or being supposed to continue, a treasonable correspondence with her son, Cardinal Pole. She loudly asserted her innocence on the scaffold, refusing to kneel at the block and telling the executioner that he might get her head as he could, a proceeding which was considered strangely presumptuous and undutiful. Somewhat more to Henry's credit was the execution of Lord Dacre of the South, with three companions, for having caused the death of a gamekeeper while engaged by way of a frolic in shooting deer in a neighbor's park without leave asked. Thus sternly was the principle vindicated that homicide is murder if done in the course of an action otherwise illegal, yet true equity would have inflicted death only on the person who actually struck the fatal blow. End of section 22. Section 23 of The Early Tudors by Charles Edward Moberly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Pamela Nagami.
Chapter 16. Henry's Last French War. Close and Results of the Reign. 1541. Part 1. Seldom has royal ambition exposed Europe to such deadly peril and suffering as when in the latter part of Francis I's reign he joined with the Turks. Even at the moment when he gave up his sword at Pavia, he ordered a servant instantly to take his ring to the Sultan as an appeal for help. And in the times which followed his liberation from captivity, he constantly used the Turkish alliance for the purposes of his ambition inducing sultan soliman to attack austria and hungary and to send his corsairs to all the seaboard of the empire while he himself with a child's pertinacity tried once more for milan charles v on the contrary though his difficulties both with france and from the protestant states of germany were immense still carried on a determined war against the port he had always intended to make his conquest of Tunis in 1535 the stepping stone to Algiers, which was a more important focus of piracy and nearer his Spanish dominions. To carry out this plan, he sent thither a magnificent fleet and army in October 1541, in spite of all warning that it was too late in the year for such an expedition. The result was that a storm came on before the troops could land their material and half the ships and men were miserably lost. Francis, overjoyed at his rival's defeat, forthwith arranged attacks upon him from Constantinople and Venice on the one side, and from Denmark, Sweden, and the German Protestant League on the other. The scheme was detestable on many grounds, for it gave a fresh spur to Soliman, who had in the previous July overthrown the combined forces of Austria and Hungary, and occupied the latter country. Besides which, Francis was fully purposed to atone for his alliance with Mohammedans and Protestants abroad by the most horrid of religious persecutions at home. His military plan was that in the summer of 1543 the Turkish fleets should ravage all Charles's Italian seaboard, while he himself should invade the emperor's dominions by the open gates of Gelderland and Cleves. But by this time Henry, vexed indeed at some French backslidings and money matters, and at their support of his enemies in Scotland, but also acting at last upon reasons of sound European policy, had agreed with the Emperor that Francis must be compelled to break his present alliance with the Turks and to repay to Charles and the Diet the money spent by them on the earlier Turkish wars which he had occasioned. The first fruits of this combination were the rejection already related of the Greenwich Treaty by the French party in Scotland, and the final breaking down of the scheme of union. The war began at once, and Charles, with Gardiner attending him as English commissioner, stormed the city of Duren, massacred its inhabitants, and forced the Duke of Cleves to beg for mercy. About 10,000 Englishmen joined their great ally at the siege of Landrecy, which had been taken and fortified as a place of arms by the French earlier in the year. The politic Charles expressed the utmost admiration for his confederates, declaring that he would live and die with them and they should be his guards. While the siege went on, the French fleet in the Mediterranean was actually cooperating with the Algerine pirate Barbarossa in an attack on Nice, the last possession which Francis had left to the Duke of Savoy. This alliance, however, was ultimately fatal to Francis's plans, for it excited such horror in Germany that Charles was able at the Diet of Speyer to proclaim war anew in the name of the whole empire against the two enemies of Christendom, whose fleets, he said, were at that moment riding side by side in a Provencal harbour. The Diet voted 24,000 men and a universal poll tax. Henry, on his part, persisted in the war in order to weaken French influence on Scotland. He had now reinforced his army up to 30,000 men and had also 25,000 Germans under his command. With these, he agreed to march on Paris from the north, while the Emperor reached it by the Valley of the Marne. Fortunately for France, this scheme was not carried out. 
Henry, whose many wars had taught him little generalship, stopped to besiege Boulogne, which held out until September 14th, and thus by its steadiness made Henry miss the rendezvous. Finding that he could not make head alone against the French, Charles fell back on Soissons, and breaking his engagement not to make a separate peace, signed the Treaty of Crepy by which Francis agreed to abandon the Turks, to help in the recovery of Hungary from them, and to join Charles in his suspended struggle with Protestantism. The emperor wanted, in fact, one thing above all others, the defeat and dispersion of the Smalcaldic League, which had become much stronger and more dangerous by the accession of Denmark. Indeed, he was not wrong in supposing that events were now deciding the future of religion in Europe. Up to this time there had been hope that the Protestants might rejoin Rome, and in 1541 the most evangelical members of the papal church had held a conference at Ratisbon to bring this about. But it had failed, and its Italian members had either decided to become Protestants or contented themselves with adhering to Catholicism as it was. As this kind of conciliation had become impossible, Pope Paul III resolved to reform the Church of Rome on her own principles, and with Jesuitism and the Inquisition for her mainstays. For this purpose he gave notice that the first session of the long-expected council would be held on March 15, 1545, at Trent in the Tyrol. To this the Protestants were not to be admitted, even if they still desired it, Indeed, one of the first resolutions of the council was for the sterner war against them, which led to their defeat at Mühlberg in 1547. Francis, on his side, was equally determined to put down heresy in his own dominions. Indeed, as soon as the peace of Crepy made Protestant allies needless, he seized the opportunity to murder 3,000 inoffensive Vaudois but he was quite equally anxious to revenge himself for the fright which England had given him by the invasion of France. Therefore, collecting in Normandy a fleet of 235 vessels of all sizes, he directed part of them to convey a force to Scotland, and the rest to make a descent at the nearest point of England, while his land army blockaded the castle of Boulogne. As in the case of the Armada long afterwards, an untoward accident marked the starting, for the king's cooks set fire by carelessness to the largest vessel of the fleet, on board which he was giving an entertainment. On the 18th of July, 1545, the ships were off the Isle of Wight. Our fleet of only sixty ships, being not strong enough to defend the Solent, ran for the shelter of the batteries, and a calm ensuing was in great danger from the enemy's galleys, which could fire at the ships without suffering in return, as their oars enabled them to move about quickly and thus baffle the English aim. Presently a breeze sprang up and we advanced again, but one large vessel, the Mary Rose, was either sunk, as French accounts will have it, by their fire, or, according to our own, lost as the Eurydice was in our own memory, by heeling over too far, so that the sea came through her lower deck ports. Anbo, the French admiral, then proposed to run up and bombard Portsmouth, but the pilots declared it impossible either to carry the fleet through the obstacles, or, if this was done, to anchor in such a tideway. He then landed several bodies of men on the Isle of Wight, with the intention of holding and fortifying several points in it, but the Act of 1487 had long ago restored its population, and the militia under Sir Edward Bellingham were able to frustrate all attempts. Finding he could make no impression, Anbo then ran over to France, discharged most of his land forces, and returning to the English coast, made a descent at Seaford, which the Sussex militia dealt with, and seemed on the point of fighting with Lords Lyle and Surrey off Shoreham but the hot August weather spoiled his provisions and bred disease in his still-crowded vessels. His chance was over, and he was obliged to retreat to Havre. Though the French pressed with all vigor the siege of Boulogne, or rather of the old citadel on the heights whose picturesque ramparts still remain, yet Sir Edward Poynings held out for the whole winter of 1545, 
with typhus ravaging both armies, and in the next June Henry agreed to surrender the place in eight years for a ransom of five million francs. In the Treaty of Peace, Scotland was included, so that French influence still remained supreme there. Next came, as usual, the difficulty of finding the million and a half which the war had cost. A benevolence had been raised for it in 1545. It was then that Alderman Rock, on refusing his quota, was ordered off for service as a private soldier on the Scottish border. This had produced about £60,000, and the remains of a subsidy were still available. The balance was now provided by a debasement of the currency. Of all modes of taxation, the one which creates most distress by throwing all contracts into disorder, reducing the value of fixed wages and incomes, and making recovery impossible by driving good money out of circulation. Yet Henry, by a succession of tamperings, reduced the quantity of silver in an ounce of coin, first to half an ounce, and later to six pennyweights nearly, the regular quantity being rather more than eighteen pennyweights. The evil, therefore, was a growing one, nor was it remedied till the first year of Elizabeth, when the coinage was at length restored by the means so graphically described by Mr. Froude. Peace was concluded with France on the 5th of June, 1546. A trifling quarrel had all but plunged us meantime into a war with the emperor. For an English captain, when ill-treated and robbed by the Inquisition in Spain, had retaliated on the first Spanish vessel which he met at sea. Henry refused to surrender the man, as he had been wronged first. Therefore Charles put an embargo on English vessels in his ports, and we in turn seized two Spanish treasure ships in the Channel. Fortunately, wiser counsels at last prevailed, and no war followed. Before the end of the French conflict, Lord Surrey had been deeply vexed at finding himself superseded in the command by Lord Hartford, and the king's death being shortly expected, he seems to have made known without the least caution his views on the situation. In case of God taking his majesty to himself, the proper guardian for the young Prince Edward would, he declared, be his father, the Duke of Norfolk. Others bore witness that he had said, not indeed to them but to others, that when the king died, he, Surrey, would deal sharply with the low-born privy councillors. Another charge was, considering the ideas of the time, a very serious one indeed. The Duchess, Surrey's mother, was a daughter of the late Duke of Buckingham. Hence, as we have seen, Surrey could claim royal descent, and he had some time before applied to the Herald's College to be allowed to quarter the royal arms on the first instead of the second division of his shield, which only the family of the reigning king were entitled to do. It must be recollected that Henry had, in 1528, ordered a heraldic visitation of the country which was to be repeated every thirty years, and such an assumption as Surrey's was an offence which had been severely dealt with in the case of Edward Hastings, who was imprisoned for sixteen years for not submitting his coat to the judgment of a court military. Moreover, the precise alteration made by Surrey had both precedent and explanation in the case of Edward III, who symbolized his claim to the throne of France by transferring the lilies from the second to the first quarter of his shield. No doubt, therefore, such a change was constructively treasonable, and the notion of degrees in treason, or of any punishment for it short of death, never seems to have found its way into the absolute logic of Henry's mind. Another charge against Lord Surrey was that he delighted to converse with foreigners and conform his behavior to theirs, an unkindly one, surely, to bring against the poet who had done so much to infuse Italian grace into the rugged forms of English poetry. His own sister, the widowed Duchess of Richmond, contributed to his ruin by confessing when questioned by the council that Surrey had urged her to use her personal attractions to captivate her father-in-law. But Henry's state of health since Richmond's death in 1536 suggests that there must have been some misunderstanding here. On these charges, or some of them, Surrey was tried at the Guildhall 
condemned and executed, the duke his father was attainted in Parliament and saved only by Henry's death a few hours before the time appointed for him to go the way of Moore and Cromwell. Considering that the evidence in these cases was chiefly hearsay, we may hope that they tended to produce the act which immediately afterwards made it capital to bring anonymous charges of treason without afterwards coming forward to prove them. Of the second persecution under the six articles, the date is unknown. Five persons perished in it. The next was in 1543, when Filmer, Testwood, and Pearson were burned under Windsor Castle for unseemly jesting on religion, and Murbeck, the church musician to whom the manner of intoning our services is mainly due, narrowly escaped the same fate, it is said, for making a concordance of the New Testament. Poor innocence, Henry had exclaimed on hearing how the men died, and in the same spirit he now interfered to protect the deposed Bishop Latimer and a physician named Huyck, who appealed to him. In 1546, the fourth and last persecution took place, when Lassels, a gentleman of the bedchamber, a priest named Bolemian, and Adams, a tailor, suffered for the still unpardonable offense of denying transubstantiation but their fame has been eclipsed by that of Anne Askew, a young and beautiful woman who was accused on the same point. With the consequences full in view, this heroine wrote, as an account of her belief, the bread is but a remembrance of his death or a sacrament of thanksgiving for it. It gives a thrill of anger even now to hear that the Lord Chancellor and Solicitor General tortured her again and again to find out who favored her. She was burned and the place watched all night to hinder her friends from doing reverence to her ashes and arrest them if they tried. A little earlier than this, an act of Parliament had placed in Henry's hands the chantries of the kingdom, that is, the innumerable foundations for private masses in cathedrals and other churches, and with them the colleges and hospitals requested him to take the property for his wars and the maintenance of his dignity. At the universities, Henry used the power thus given him to compel the surrender of several Cambridge halls and to found Trinity College out of their collective property. Its larger endowments, however, were due not to him but to Queen Mary. In the same spirit, Henry left to the citizens of London the ancient priory of St. Bartholomew to be a hospital for the poor. Within a few days of the death of Catherine Howard, the king married Catherine Parr, the widow of the Lord Latimer, who had been engaged in the pilgrimage of grace and pardoned after it. This lady was a most kind stepmother to all his children and a first-rate nurse to himself. Her Cambridge correspondents called her Regina Doctissima, and their admiration is justified by her book of devotion called The Lamentation of a Sinner. She was inclined to Protestantism, her almoner being Miles Coverdale, is said to have interceded for Murbeck, and certainly contributed much to the conviction for perjury of Dr. London, who, after distinguishing himself in the visitation of the monasteries, had undertaken the congenial task of forging evidences in cases of heresy. This made Chancellor Risley and Bishop Gardiner her bitter enemies, and according to Lord Herbert of Cherbury, they succeeded in inducing the king to have articles of heresy drawn out against her, as having received forbidden books from her sister, Lady Herbert. Henry, it appears, had been annoyed by her pressing him strongly to allow the general use of the translated Bible, and therefore gave his consent to the articles. Risley, however, accidentally dropped the paper containing them, and thus it came to Catherine's knowledge. She at first gave herself up for lost, but presently succeeded in persuading her husband that if she had ever spoken to him on theology, it was in order to be herself instructed. It is supposed that the torture of Anne Askew was intended to elicit evidence against the Queen, but if so, it failed signally of its purpose. On Friday, the 28th of January, 1547, Norfolk was to die at nine in the morning, but when that time struck, Henry had been dead eight hours, and the duke was safe. Late on the preceding evening, the king had been told that his end was near, 
on which he characteristically said that as his physicians had condemned him, their work was over, and he wanted no more interference from them. He would send for no one but Cranmer, and put this off so long that when the archbishop arrived, he could only press his hand as a sign that he looked for mercy through Christ. He desired to be buried at Windsor in the same tomb with Queen Jane, and like his father ordered that masses should be said there perpetually while the world shall endure. Finally, with unwavering faith, he asked for the intercession of the Blessed Virgin and the Saints. During his absence at Boulogne in 1544, Queen Catherine had been his regent, but to her great disappointment she found the power given by Henry's will to a council of regency headed by Cranmer. As Parliament had in 1536 allowed the king to dispose of the crown by will, he placed first Mary and then Elizabeth in succession after Edward on condition that they married only with the royal consent. Foreseeing in all probability the marriage which so very soon took place between Catherine and Sir Thomas Seymour, the lover from whom he had taken her, he allowed her only a moderate provision. End of section 23. Section 24 of the Early Tudors by Charles Edward Moberly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 16 Henry's Last French War, Close and Results of the Reign, 1541, Part 2. At his death, Henry left the church still under the six articles though procedure according to them had on purpose been made more difficult. Its position had also been defined by the necessary doctrine and erudition of a Christian man, generally called the King's Book, which was printed for the first time in 1544, having been accepted by the Parliament in the previous year. Many of its statements are, as we might expect, more Roman in tone than those of its predecessor, the Bishop's Book, but fortunately for the church, there had grown up besides these formularies something of far better omen for the future. Erasmus had adopted in the years from 1516 to 1535 the bold course of publishing successive editions of the Greek Testament, based upon in great part, though not entirely, the evidence of manuscripts. This was in effect a declaration that St. Jerome's Latin translation generally called the Vulgate, had not really the final and conclusive authority ascribed to it by the Roman Church. His paraphrases also set the good example of explaining all passages with their full context, instead of taking a verse here and there and drawing random inferences from it, in the manner of which we have seen an example in the discussion on the exemption of the clergy from the civil courts. Moreover, the Bible had, as we have seen, been twice translated, and though Tyndall suffered martyrdom at Vilvorda, and the circulation of the English Bible was fenced about with many restrictions and sometimes nearly stopped, it had still been publicly declared to be the only touchstone of true learning. The Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments had been taught in English since 1539. In 1543 and 1544, English litanies were used by authority, and Cranmer also translated the Te Deum and other hymns in order that all such as were ignorant of any strange or foreign speech might have what to pray in their own familiar and acquainted tongue with fruit and understanding. Thus everything was ready for the great work of Edward's first years, the drawing up of the Book of Common Prayer in a form like that which we still have though in some points nearer to that now used by the Episcopal churches in Scotland and America. Roman Catholic writers have constantly assumed not only that these formularies are heretical, but that the effect of Henry's ordinances has been to enslave the Church of England to the state. The former of these points can hardly be discussed in a work like the present. On the latter, it will be enough to remark once more that at the time 
it was absolutely necessary to check the use by the clergy of their independent powers. It deeply concerned the very being of religion in England that priests should neither kill their parishioners for Christ's sake, nor plot against their property, nor claim immunity from crime as a privilege of their order. Hardly anything indeed could be more violent and therefore more anti-Christian than their attempts to compel belief by penalties. It cannot be doubted that Henry's Parliament did rightly in depriving them of powers so much misused, nor has anything since occurred to make us wish the changes undone. It has been well that the sturdy sense of Parliament should have to be persuaded before religious changes could be made, well, too, at least in times when the people have cared for religion, that bishops should be chosen, not according to the narrow standard of purely clerical electors, but by a minister of the crown who, with every reason both of feeling and interest, to select wise and practical men for the office, can also resist currents of temporary church feeling, and in some degree see events as history will see them. Under no other institutions, perhaps, would the Church, by losing step by step all compulsory powers, have been so wholesomely trained and so perpetually encouraged to rely on persuasion only, thus gaining a strength which she never could have dreamed of in her masterful days. And although agitation has sometimes been created in our own time by the sentences of certain civil courts in Church questions, Yet such judgments have been generally acquiesced in when the immediate stir has been over, and found not in any way to lower the church or to fetter her development. It would be hard to point to any one good thing desired by the church which has been hindered by her relations to the state, or to any evil thing to which they have given a longer life. If uncorrected abuses still exist, we may be sure that they remain so because members of the Church have not yet made up their minds that they are intolerable, and not because the law being what it is, such things must needs live on to vex us however much we may dislike them. The laws affecting religion occupy so large a space in this reign that those on civil matters are apt to escape notice, though many of them well deserve to be remembered. Such were those affecting beggars, who, if really impotent, were to have written leave to ask alms in a specified district, if whole and mighty in body, were to be whipped the first time they begged and sent home to their own parish, where by another law the overseers were bound to employ them. If any such person offended a second time, the gristle of his ear was to be cut off besides a whipping and for a third offence he was to die as an enemy of the commonwealth. On the same principle of hatred to people with no visible livelihood, all gypsies were in 1530 sent out of the country. Another kind of poverty which the age could not tolerate was that of the poor and broken bankrupt. It was held that the crime and its name were both of foreign growth, and the surrender of all the insolvent's property would never give him a discharge till the last farthing was paid. An Act of 1546 repealed the old laws of usury, allowing interest to be charged up to 10%. New felonies were created under Henry VIII as quickly and easily as when Burke made his celebrated protest against them. It became felony to cut dikes in Norfolk or the Isle of Ely, to sell horses to Scotchmen, to poach fish between six in the evening and six in the morning, to come masked into a royal park in order to kill deer, to steal young hawks or peacocks, or to burn any frame of timber prepared for building a house. New treasons were still more profusely invented, going far beyond the old definition of Edward III which almost limited the crime to the three cases of levying war against the king, compassing his death, or adhering to his enemies. For Henry's Parliament declared at different times that those were traitors who took, judged, or believed the marriages with Catherine of Aragon or Anne of Cleves to have been valid, 
who impugned the marriage with Anne Boleyn, who called the king a heretic, schismatic, or usurper, who married any of the king's family without his permission, who married the king himself without revealing past lapses, or who disobeyed any royal proclamation and then escaped from the kingdom. Lastly, in one peculiar case, such a law was ex post facto. A cook named Rouse had tried to poison his master, the Bishop of Rochester, and caused the death of two persons. Such acts were therefore made treasonable by a general law, which mentioned him by name and sentenced him to be boiled to death. If from the laws against crime we pass on to the manner in which the courts administered them, it is too plain that hardly any sound principles of justice were known or thought of. Else how could it have been that hardly any prisoners of state were ever acquitted? Experience has taught us that evidence is generally worthless unless cross-examined, but rarely indeed had an accused person any such chance then, not to mention that the bad habit of prosecuting not for the crime but for just so much as would bring the accused under the letter of the law must have destroyed the chances of showing discrepancy in the evidence which would have been if the witnesses had been forced to state all they knew of course a government which so administers justice must be cynically indifferent to one of its prime duties that of showing unmistakably to all men even to the culprit himself that if the law strikes him it is because he has thoroughly deserved it not all englishmen of the time had cromwell's italian unscrupulousness learned as he himself said from machiavelli as to the means by which his ends were to be accomplished but it is not the less true that such outrages on justice introduced into the national temper a mixture of cruelty and hypocrisy which it took centuries to eradicate. The barrenness of the last reign in the field of literature still continued, as is natural in a time when religious controversy fills all men's minds. Indeed, popular poetry was far better represented in Scotland, which the Reformation had barely yet reached. By the really beautiful poems of Dunbar and Gawain Douglas, the translator of Virgil, than by anything which England had to show at the same time. In Dunbar's Timor Mortis Conturbit May, we see here and there that Shakespeare has been beforehand with us in admiring him, as in the graceful stanza, I see that makers, poets among the lave, plays here their pageants, sin goes to grave, spared is not their faculty, Timor Mortis Conturbit May. He fully deserves to be called, as he is by Professor Morley, the best English poet since the days of Chaucer. His charming, without gladness avails no treasure, is even alone sufficient to prove this. Gawain Douglas, who was Bishop of Dunkeld under Margaret of Scotland, manages skillfully enough in his King Heart, a stanza something like Ariosto's, and his allegorical treatment seems to have given many hints to Spencer. Sir David Lindsay's verse, as Walter Scott said, still has charms. His poem of Jock Up a Land ends with a fervent prayer that James V may be strong enough to ding those money kings a dune who are making Scotland so miserable. And when James freed himself from his guardians, Sir David was not backward in poetically teaching him the real meaning of liberty. In England, the palm of satiric verse it can hardly be called poetry, was born by Skelton, who left off mocking at the great cardinal only when obliged in 1528 to take sanctuary at Westminster and thus avoid his vengeance. His Colin Clout is on the need of reformation in church and state. In speak, parrot, and why come ye not to court? He makes his bitterest attacks on Wolsey, and in Philip Sparrow he describes with much humor a tender-hearted nun's grief for her lost pet. With Sir Thomas Wyatt and the Earl of Surrey began the refined imitation of Italian poetic forms. In their hands, verse seemed to become suddenly modern. They introduced the sonnet in English, and Wyatt at least shows in his renouncing of love 
that he has gained from Petrarca a real sense of its capabilities. He also, in his poem on the courtier's life, employs Dante's Terza Rima. Surrey, too, was an inventor in poetry. To him is due the first English blank verse, as used in a translation from the Aeneid. His sonnets, though far less melodious than Milton's, yet have the descriptions of personal character of which the latter poet makes such noble use. This may be seen in Surrey's sonnets on the fair Geraldine and on his faithful follower Richard Clear. The drama was at this time very much in the rough, though it is almost surprising to see how much Shakespeare condescends to borrow from the humours of Udall's Ralph Royster which was probably written in this reign. Haywood was also celebrated at the time for interludes, one of the best being The Four Peas, a dialogue between Pardoner, Palmer, Potticary, and Peddler. The honour of English prose was still sustained chiefly by Sir Thomas More's history of Edward V and by the Utopia. Theologians, however, did much to establish purity of style, especially when they wished to be simple in order to instruct the common people. Cranmer's Institution of a Christian Man is really excellent from its direct and winning expression, and though Hugh Latimer did not much conform to any art canons, yet few Englishmen have ever equaled him in the power of downright preaching, especially on semi-political subjects. Above all, of course, the Bible had been beautiful in Tyndall's translation, and was gradually advancing to that perfection which has won the hearts of revisers in the present day. Scientific study could hardly be said to exist as yet. Men were far more curious to know the Latin and Greek names of natural objects, as Erasmus recommended, than to investigate their properties. Hardly any scientific works appear to have been sold by an Oxford bookseller whose trade diary from 1520 onwards has been preserved. It has been already noted that Lineker, the most truly scientific man of the reign, did not describe the most remarkable diseases of his own time. Indeed, he aimed perhaps wisely at restoring medicine through the works of the ancients, rather than by direct observation, and devoted himself almost entirely to translations from Galen. The science of the day had not yet broken its connection with the occult sciences. Even the earnest and severe Paul III, Pope as he was, never held a consistory or entered upon anything important without consulting the stars. Henry VIII, as we have seen, questioned soothsayers about the sex of his future children with the same faith which afterwards made Charles I send five hundred pounds to an astrologer when he was planning his escape from Hampton Court. He also invited to England the celebrated Cornelius Agrippa, whose reputation for magical knowledge was high. Alchemy was in great vogue at Paris, where hundreds of adepts were following each his own system. In England it was less popular, inasmuch as the celebrated D, afterwards so favoured by Elizabeth, had to leave Cambridge on beginning to study it. The belief in witchcraft was shown in England by the statute of 1541 already referred to, but only after popes had been fulminating against it for fifty years, and prosecutions had long been innumerable in France, Germany, and Italy. It is remarkable that the statute made it penal, not in itself, but only if it aimed at destroying life. It is always difficult clearly to discern the everyday character and feeling of people in times long past, yet we are not quite without hints what Englishmen were like in the sixteenth century. The kindliness and sobriety displayed here in times of pestilence have been noticed above. Akin to the same temper was the general submission to established authority. Even when, without the support of any standing army or organized police, it was carrying the most violent changes. Even in the worst times, a hundred yeomen of the guard were enough to secure Henry's person. Probably the real reason for this obedience was the same dread of renewing civil war, which afterwards made England endure without rebelling, the many misdoings of Charles II. 
of the social temper of our countrymen in those days there are curiously opposite accounts a french traveller complains of their hatred for all foreigners especially his countrymen of the bad names which they call them and of the way in which they break their word a german on the other hand cannot say enough of english politeness to the aged and to those whom they consider learned of their incredible courtesy and friendliness of speech of the beauty of the ladies who he says never heretic ketzer in their faces with paint and strangest of all of the wondrous comfort civility and respect which travellers received in english inns of course the relations of english commerce to germany and france as described above may throw much light on these contradictions in statement pleasant it would be to look into the interior of more families and see whether there were many in england where the love of father and daughter was so profound as that between sir thomas moore and margaret roper and into more meetings of heretics to search for affection like that between the labber and garrett in fifteen twenty eight i besought garrett says the labber that he for the tender mercies of god would not refuse me saying that i trusted verily that he which had begun this in me would not forsake me but give me grace to continue therein unto the end when he heard me say so he kissed me the tears trickling from his eyes and said to me the lord god almighty grant you so to do and from henceforth for ever take me for your father and i will take you for my son in christ we need not inquire whether the new beliefs or indeed the old ones made men brave those who were first to conceive novelties or who had first to defend old things might be bewildered by their position but soon there grew up in both a courage which literally seemed to think nothing of the fire a slight forcing of language would have saved lambert's life forrest certainly need not have expressed any opinion about cardinal fisher's death yet both these men determinedly spoke out in spite of the terrors which lay before them and would not have varied their mode of statement by a hair's breadth to save their life some of the reforming party have been blamed for a flippancy and abusiveness before their judges which made it more difficult to show them any indulgence nor can the charge be altogether denied but then it is beyond most men to die like latimer with no harsh word to his persecutors or like moore with a wish that he and they might find mercy together in a better world even if some came short of this their tongue violence may be condoned since they were quite as willing to die for their cause as to rail at its enemies here then this brief summary of two reigns must end it will be for abler hands with the help of the fresh material which every year now accumulates to trace the gradual expulsion from our political system of the bad elements of tudor despotism to this henry the eighth in spite of all appearances contributed both negatively and positively negatively because his striking personality dignified in a manner the violences which he committed and the extravagances which he forced his parliament to enact so that subsequent kings of less imposing character were likely to fail in attempting the like could his modes of government have been established they would have been hardly less than a turkish despotism but they lived only in the unregulated and despotic spirit which they were intended to gratify drooped and flagged when he was gone and by no means uprooted from the minds of englishmen the remembrance of their ancient liberties and he also most unwittingly but still really gave our freedom more than one kind of positive help for his rough and violent hand broke down superstitions which though we now regard them tenderly we should have been sure to denounce if we had lived at the time he raised up out of the spoils of the monasteries the great and strong middle class which was at length to curb his successors above all his way of referring constantly to parliament because he found it servile and bringing such a variety of affairs under its cognizance had at least the effect of keeping its powers well in mind against the time when some fortunate election might send up to westminster 
a body of members with principles worth having, and a strong determination to make them good against all opposition. He trained Parliament to register his edicts, but the very fact that they had to do so proved their inherent right to dispute them if they would. Therefore, when, as Burke says, new times brought with them new modes of tyranny, it was a light thing for Parliament to use against Elizabeth's monopolies, or James's claim that the seacoast was his own, or Charles's demand for ship money, the power which had been technically acknowledged in so many various forms, and as applying to affairs so important. In these two ways, then, the institutions of Henry VIII have favored English freedom. End of section 24. Read by Pamela Nagami in Encino, California, May 2022. End of the Early Tudors, Henry VII and Henry VIII, by Charles Edward Moberly.